Oh, right. So I figured I will throw a provocative question uh, to start the, the conference. Uh, hope it will be interesting. Uh, thank you, first of all, thank you everyone for coming to this annual CEFM MVPF conference. It's always a joy to see new people uh, coming, new blood, and always also very nice to see uh, friends uh, who come and we see how this uh, community keeps growing. So this is really awesome. Um, to be able to answer this, uh, well, somewhat absurd, I guess, question, we first need to define what the anthem is. Anthem is easy, right? So <laughs> it's an uplifting, uplifting song identified for the particular group. But uh, what is VPF, right? Realistically, like there is only one correct answer here, so that's that's the key. So it is technology. It's nothing but technology. But uh, I've been reading some like negative comments about VPF on LWN, sometimes on IRC channels, and like to me this is weird. Like people cannot hate technology, so it means there is some misunderstanding what VPF is. So for people who hate it, there must be something that's like missing. And on the other side of the spectrum, VPF is used as a buzzword. I've heard uh, Silicon Valley VC firms using VPF as a check mark. The startups are pitching the uh, slide deck to VCs when they, if they have a VPF on the slides, they will have a higher chance of securing funds. This is another thing absurd. So like there are two extremes here. VPF is just a technology. So we need to use wisdom of uh, Humpy Dumpy uh, to actually say, to, to define what BPF is. In his words, we can define it as nothing uh, more, no less. But as Alice would be saying, well, there is always somebody else in the, uh, somebody else that will be thinking differently about it. So my definition of BPF, that BPF is universal assembly language. As, as Hampi would say, nothing else and nothing more. It's universal assembly language. Uh, in other words, BPF is a sequence command that can be understood. So this is a scene uh, from the movie Arrival. And in this case, uh, Amy Adams uh, explaining the aliens how to exit VI. Uh, the analogy was BPF that she used a language that aliens can understand. So, and because, because it's understandable, it's understandable, it's universal assembly language, it's not only used by the user space to tell the kernel what to do, and kernel understands what it is. Then the kernel can say, yes, I will accept this code, I know what it's gonna do, or it can say, no, like come back next time. At the same time, it can be done the other way around. The hardware can tell kernel what it intends to do. So the, the understandability of the assembly instruction is the key to understand here. I also have seen people using VPF uh, between two servers, two zero space applications. It's again about under verifiability and understandability of something. And some people will say like, how does it compare to like traditional instructions that like x86? In x86, CPU understands one instruction and does what uh, it's supposed to do. Whereas in BPF, BPF understand the whole sequence of command, the whole program understands. That's the major difference between x86, Spark, RISC, whatever assembly instruction set and VPF assembly language. Uh, there was a question about Rust. Uh, partially it's related to sandboxing. Some people say that VPF is a virtual machine. VPF is a sandboxing mechanism. It's not, right? So VPF understands the program. It doesn't need to sandbox it, whereas any sandboxing like WebAssembly, so WebAssembly keep brought it up like all the time. WebAssembly is a sandboxing technology. Sandbox doesn't know what will be running inside of it. That's why like all sorts of guardrails has to be uh, done. And in the understability comes the verifiability of this instruction set. So um, another, I think I've heard uh, people throw at BPF all the time is, well, I will be writing code in C because it will be faster in C. So it's, <laughs> it's not quite true. Like the experience and the benchmarking that XDP folks did clearly like, demonstrated that 
like translating from C to VPF and then to assembly, or directly from C to assembly, you get exactly the same performance. And back to sandboxing, because sandboxing doesn't know what will run inside, it has to use this foreign function interface to transition between native into sandboxed code. And that's where like all the performance overhead comes. So that's the major difference when people say like, how is it different? How like Rust different versus BPF? How sandboxing is different versus BPF is being able to understand and having this native interface. And finally, we can answer the question that was on the slide, what should be the answer of BPF? I didn't come up with it. Let me just read it what AI said. In the kernel, there is a tool. What it can do is pretty cool. It can trace, it can filter, it can load and unload. It's time for you to get on board. Uh, then I asked AI to uh, combine a B, a P as a vegetable, and a letter F, and that's what it came up with. Uh, I've tried a couple times, and every time it was this sad B. I guess because it's got green from eating peas, and the eyes look like peas. But that's, that's what AI can do. So uh, I also asked AI where BPF is used, and that was an answer. I didn't change a single letter uh, here. It's like fully AI generated. I've read it a couple times. It's a bit repetitive, but pretty much looks correct. I also asked uh, AI write a BPF program that parses APU4. I didn't compile it, but it looks correct. I, again, here, didn't change a single character. All of the comments here written by AI. It seems to me it's pretty valid uh, XDP program. So AI and search engines can answer all of these questions. What's the answer of BPF? Though it's an absurd question, it can answer it. Where, it can, where it's used, write a program that does like foo, but what AI cannot do is uh, see through the VPF as its mission statement. Like, to me, it's really dear to my heart. So the values that I post here are my values and the values, I think, of VPF community, and that's what bring us together. Like, in the first place, it's uh, innovation and enabling others to innovate. It may sound, I don't know, uh, artificial, but this is effectively my checklist when I uh, review the patches. Like one thing, it's a fix um, that's different, but when somebody proposes a patch set that adds a new feature. So my first uh, check mark would be, is it a new feature? Is it introducing something new to the BPF ecosystem and the kernel? And if it's not, it probably means that this particular feature could have been done as something else. Some previous feature could have been extended uh, to, to do it. So it, is, it, is, it would be like a first red flag. If people who presented something they didn't think through about extending something else. The second is whether it enable others to innovate. It means that uh, for this particular feature, whether it's solving one particular need. It could be like super innovative, but if it's solving the needs of only one user or one set of users, People who, it means that the people who are doing it, they're not thinking about communities abroad. They're not thinking about enabling other companies, other people to innovate in the same space, right? And the last part here is the challenge, the status quo. Uh, there are, I think, like also plenty of examples where people um, repeat what they know. They see like, okay, we've been using, let's say, Netlink all the time, so well, let's use Netlink again. Or there was, um, priorities and in, in the way we attach things to TC, like there is a prior, there is, let's just use the same stuff to use BPF. It's not necessarily a red flag for me, but it's a sign that the uh, uh, status quo wasn't challenged. It means that there was not enough uh, thinking outside of the box that was done. So why I think it's relevant? It helped us uh, maintainers and developers to get on the same page. It reduces the, hopefully reduces the friction once this values of innovation and enabling innovation they understood. For example, uh, the real example for me here is the whole uh, helpers with the KFUNC discussion. Like helpers enabled others, uh, enabled us uh, to like, to grow the BPF ecosystem over the last like many years. But a uh, year and a half ago, KFUNCs were introduced. And the KFUNC compared to helpers just provide higher velocity of innovation. Um, 
recently at KubeCon like a month ago, somebody uh, added kfunk to call WebSM, to call from BPF program through the kfunk call a WebAssembly. So they ported the whole WebAssembly into the kernel and through addition of kfunk they did it. So that's an innovation that kfunks enabled. Understanding the values helps uh, users and sponsors. And by sponsors, I mean, I mean uh, directors and VPs. When they see what community is doing, what other people are proposing to the kernel, they see what's, um, what problems they are trying to solve, right? When, people, when um, people see the problems, they can like extrapolate where the community is going, what the other companies, why, why it is matters for them, why it is meta, ma matters for them. Uh, another example of successful users, I would say, is Cilium. So Cilium built a whole uh, ecosystem on top of VPF. It's its own like thriving open source projects that enables others to innovate on top of it. Another example would be all of the BCC tools and uh, now what is called now only BPF tools. In the beginning, it was Brandon Gregg who seeded this community with the first like 20 tools or so, and People like, keep saying, once a BPF like, goes into some piece of the kernel, there is no, like everyone will be doing like proprietary stuff. That didn't happen with Cilium. That didn't happen with BCC. Brandon did this first 20 tools. Now, uh, I've checked yesterday, we have 130 BCC tools. So after this initial thing, people, people didn't go out, didn't start like uh, doing their proprietary stuff. That's for them is making the difference. People do give back because of innovation. And um, I keep being asked, what's the biggest challenge for VPF? I asked AI, and AI said it must be complexity and security and verification and so on. Uh, it's, I guess it's close enough. To me, it's ease of use. Um, this is the graph uh, we see all the time. People who are new to BPF, they start, they have like a lot of excitement, and then they quickly get burned by the verifier. And I think we have to fix this uh, slope. We have to fix this curve. We knew about it for a while. And we, like the developers who've been around, they're on this productivity plateau, but the new people still go through the cycle. So this is something we have to keep in mind. They have to consciously uh, address moving forward. Another extremely interesting part uh, that happened in the last year, it actually I think was after the FMM, uh, is a major shift in how we think about VPF. In the past it was all the standard uh, stable hook, stable set of helpers that called uh, well-defined maps and return cordis was also well-defined. So that was BPF and the kernel. Essentially it was like standing next to the kernel. Uh, now I call it BPF in the kernel. Uh, there is nothing, there is no boundary between. So like BPF and the kernel piece, the stack structure, they all interleaved. The programs can now take the reference count on the kernel on object, can stash it, and all of it with the safety of the verifier. We call this new tracing, and some of the subsystem already taking advantage of it. Then it filters the recent filter stuff, all the struct tops, the TCP congestion control, SCADXT is definitely in this category, and hit BPF. Like hit BPF uh, added, uh, started using BPF without changing the, the core at all. So it was completely done in the hit subsystem. And of course, there is level no stable API. So quiz uh, to this room, like which part uh, of the puzzle is written in C? Well, obviously the answer is like all of it. At the end, BPF is nothing but C. It's somewhat restricted because of the verifier smartness, quote, quote. But at the same time, it's a safer C and it is extended C. And my last slide is uh, call to action. So how do you see, it's really the answer, uh, it's a question like to you folks, uh, how do you see this vision apply to you? Don't need to answer now, but uh, can we do this together? Please help us spread the word. We're a big, big um, uh, community. And that's, and of course, send patches. Thank you. Where is James? No, he doesn't care about trust. I guess he didn't want to hear the answer. Okay. 
that's my one. Yeah, I mean, feedback from you guys, questions. Okay. Just as an anecdote, um, for the, you know, having the door open for feedback to make it better, for K-pointers, that was one area where feedback didn't fundamentally change the feature, but it really changed it a lot. Like, originally, you had to call a K-funk to get, an ac to get a, a ref count on a K-pointer, and there were all sorts of kind of baked-in assumptions, like, you know, is this RCU safe, is it not? And with Skeddy XT, we, we said we really just want to be able to use RCU to protect a lot of objects. And so a lot of changes went in to make, uh, to make uh, RCU kind of a core part of the verifier where you can say, is this pointer actually RCU safe or not? And that enabled Skeddy XT to uh, be really useful for meta. I mean, we're still trying to upstream it, but we were able to get a scheduler that uh, improves throughput by about 1.5% um, for our main web workloads. And I think and latency is also much better, and I think that's because we didn't have to, we didn't have to uh, you know, be calling k-funks on the hot path and stuff. So. Yeah, just you know, I just wanted to add an example of of how uh, that's that's being applied. Yeah, SkyDXT was rewritten, I would say, three times, uh, and like keep uh, being changed, uh, but not uh, to that huge degree. And uh, a lot of the innovation that happened in BPF over the last year was driven by SkyDXT. So it's huge thanks to Tijun for uh, pushing the boundary and actually like believing in the BPF values, like uh, innovating in the scheduler space and um, challenging what possible. Like he was telling us that, well, why can't I just like grab the kernel pointer and put it here? We're like, well, because well, we cannot guarantee the safety and it took us a while, as uh, David just said, to make the K pointer useful. At one point we thought, uh, uh, that KPTR design is just great, everyone will love it. Like TJ started to use it and they're like, well, it's kind of still not neat. How about you just like let it access directly without uh, atomic, uh, atomic exchange just because it's under RCU. So we went back to the drawing board and added all of the stuff. It's explicit now um, RCU read lock and lock inside, inside programs. Hi. Um, my question is regarding uh, stability or uh, API. Like, uh, I remember it was discussed uh, a few years ago when Brendan was giving a keynote in LSF and he was asked uh, what if a kernel upgrade will break one of the very, very useful uh, BCC programs? Uh, what will happen? Will the kernel developer need to revert the change? So I think there may have been development in this area, but can you say something about it? Uh, last maintainer summit, uh, Linus was pretty clear about it. Uh, there is, it's not a concern to him in the first place. It's not a concern to me, and it's not a concern to Brendan Gregg. And if you followed what BCC is doing, uh, kernel changes broke BCC scripts multiple times. Yeah. I know. I experienced that. Yeah. And, well, did any of the kernel changes get reverted over the last 10 years because of BC script? BC scripts existed for 10 years. No, I, I'm not personally concerned about it, but there was, there has been a precedent with, uh, I think, perf top. So? Uh, that, that, that has caused the revert in the past, you know, so and? that's a precedent. I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking if there is anything new about it or is that the status quo? I'm not gonna repeat what Linus Kimpin saying. It's like there are the billionaire articles. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. as Linus as Linus said, you remember what he said, right? <laughs> Mike. Since uh, it was me that he was yelling at, um, I remember very vividly exactly what he said. <laughs> So basically, he just says, it hasn't yet hurt me. And so I don't think it's a problem. But hey, I may be wrong in five years. He said that too. Yes. yes. In which he would exactly. revert something. So it's right now the concern is basically, uh, don't worry about it until it happens. <laughs> That's basically what basically Lena said. Pretty much.
thanks very much. Um, you mentioned the new way to kind of add things is the KFUNCS. There's no stable API, but there are going to be maintainers that want to kind of expose something that is fairly stable, right? If you think about XTP, one of the uh, kind of the original OG use cases, I would say, at least for me, is like, okay, you have this program and you can have this very reliable infrastructure you can build on, you can kind of rely on it. Um, for our critical infrastructure, like what's the idea going forward? Like how, how would a maintainer do that in a world where KFUNCS are a thing? Is it just don't change the function signature and you're fine? Or is there more, is there more nuance to that? See, there is no uh, black and white, right? Just like in the kernel, uh, there is export symbol. And there is KMALIC as export symbol that existed forever, yet KMALIC was changing. And so it's always gray, right? So some of the stuff will be as stable as it can get, more stable than your API, like KMALIC export symbol. Did it ever change in the last 20 years? No. And there were plenty of other export symbols that were added, then removed, and then changed many times. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the benefits and drawbacks, I guess, of the fact that we have something like Core with BPF programs is you don't have to compile a BPF program to a specific kernel. And that means that it's a feature where you can use this BPF program across lots of kernel versions, but it also means, unlike modules, which obviously you have to compile for a specific kernel and it won't even load if you do a different kernel. Um, so there's some sort of inherent, like, you know, it's, it's a benefit. But then people, I think, tend to look at that and they're like, oh, so if a kernel version breaks a BPF program, it means it's a regression. I mean, who knows what Linus is going to say, as, as Stephen said, which is true. But I would hope that if you look, if you compare modules to BPF programs, none of the things that we're talking about are in UAPI headers. These are all essentially export symbol GPL abstractions. And so hopefully you wouldn't penalize a BPF program because it has more, it makes it easier for, for kernel developers to use, right? I mean. If you consider the guarantees the same, but in practicality, you're, you're probably less likely to have to worry about it. I mean, yeah, that seems like a pure positive. And if you, if you, if it becomes, if it's, if, it, if it becomes, you know, like an interpretation of, well, you have to be stable all the time, I would call that a misinterpretation and kind of an unfortunate outcome that really wasn't intended. So another example would be the heat BPF. Again, uh, maintainer summit. So uh, Benjamin really wanted to say uh, to its future users of heat BPF framework that the API that KFUNX exposed is stable. And Linus said, like, dude, don't. Like, why are you even saying this? Why, why do you want to make it stable when, like, why do you want this burden? I'm paraphrasing, but roughly it's like, don't make stuff, don't promise stability when you don't know whether it actually will be useful or not. So that's what we're doing, like KFUNCS, uh, all KFUNCS around KPTR, so like this. We thought they will be like great, better than bread and butter. Well, a year later, it turned out not that much. Another question. You showed that graph, I really liked it. Um, any ideas for how to to even the slope, to bulldoze it? I don't know. Well, uh, one thing is for sure help uh, don't um, think of BPF as only like kernel and your favorite user space project community, but it there are many pieces, LLVM and GCC, and currently we do need your help with LLVM. In LVM, we, for years, been uh, struggling to uh, explain that BPF is a different assembly language. They all think that, well, if compiler is, uh, can do a valid transformation, it's okay to do this transformation for any assembly. So this understability, whatever, verifiability of instruction set uh, was missing uh, for majority of the LVM folks are just saying, well, the compiler is allowed to do this. So now when we are still struggling, in the past we did all sorts of hacks inside the LVM. We undid some of them. We do the uh, pattern matching on the backend and do the transformation. That wasn't enough. Then we introduced fake inline assembly, sort of. We see we pattern match now on a C code, 
then wrap it in a faking assembler, send it through the LVM pipeline so that LVM will not optimize it. And this is like thousand upon thousand lines of code where we do these hacks. Only because LVM people saying, well, it's a valid optimization. So we need your help to explain why it is necessary for us. Um, do, we, do we have a, do we want to talk about that this week? Do we have a plan? I mean, to, to put, like, to point out how bad this is, right? At one point on the Tetragon or security tool, I, I forked LLVM and just cut out optimizations, right? Because they were breaking the code. Eventually, that was, like, not maintainable because once it was more than just me working on it, everyone was like, well, I, you can't fork Clang, right? Like, it's, you have to maintain Clang. Yeah. So... I believe Cloudflare did this at some point. They froze the LLVM because I, of this. I mean, I, I forked it and was backporting everything off the eBBF branch into my fork for a year or two, right? And, and I eventually the got argument, rid of it, but I've lost a bunch of stuff because I'm... The argument from LLVM folks that is, oh, it's a slippery slope. We don't know, like, how many optimization do you want to disable? There are actually very few. Like over the years, we identified all of them. There are a handful, like really less than five. And only because we don't disable transformation that like, uh, we disable those that make the code unreadable. Where LVM changes something that cannot be inferred from the, like the transformation, the code, the assembly before and after. If before, like you can understand what it's supposed to do, after you miss transformation because the information is lost. So yep. those are the only transformation that we want to disable, and there are like four. Young know, Hong can like tell exactly. But I, I think when you say people are burned by the verifier, they're really being burned by Clang half majority Most of the time, of the time right? Because yes. usually you get this. A lot of a lot of errors of the verifier are, are, are coherent, but then when you get these ones where Clang moves stuff around, it just says like complexity is lost, right? This is like. And there's no way, really, that I see for the verifier to tell the user. Like, at that point, it just takes like intuition and understanding what Clang's doing to really fix that bug, right? Like, I don't know how to teach somebody. Like, when the verifier tells you this complexity error, oh, um, you just need to move this line of code up to LaRose and then change that from a static to a whatever, right? Like, these, yeah. the, the conversion to make those work is is sort of not. There's no formula that I can give you versus like say like. Absolutely. No bound. Like, yeah, that one's it's, obvious. It's right? really like compiler, I think, people. Yeah. Like, the, I've been working on compilers for 10 plus years before I was working on the kernel. Uh, so I relate <laughs> because, like, people who work on compilers, their all daily job is to find, create a new transformation <laughs> that give me, like, extra 0.1% on some benchmark. And that's, yeah. that's great. Uh, but they're missing that all of this transformation, compiler optimization, they heard. And the last example was, like, we keep catching that new diffs in LVM that break stuff. The last one was, like, people decided to enable some transformation that in the past was only done at dash dot three level. And they said, well, pff, why not? I want to do it dash dot two. So, and what this transformation did, they've, uh, in some cases, they added another argument to a function. So the function would take like five arguments, we pass five arguments, and the compiler said, I'm smart, I can just add another argument here. Like it's a six argument, and immediately BPF backend said, I cannot even compile it. There is no way I can pass like six mm -hmm. arguments. And we're arguing with this LLVM people, and they're like, why? Just pass it on the stack. It's like, we don't have a definition of the six argument today. What do you mean? We're just breaking everything. They're like, nope, we're not going to revert it. It's like, it's your bug. Oh, yeah, this is not exactly the same as what you guys are talking about, but somebody is also implementing uh, assertions. So for the whole burn, burn by the verifier slope, um, a lot of that is also you just have to go through your programs and add like lots of boilerplate and bounce checking and stuff like that. So hopefully that will allow programs to be simplified a lot, at least in terms of what the human being sees. So that's another thing. I mean, I, don't, I, th I think it's probably still in its early stages, but um, that should hopefully help a little bit. Uh, yeah, so you can, so for example, um, let's say that like uh, you call some K funk that could return like a nullable pointer so you would have to check if it's null and then go to some branch where you like drop all of your references and then exit the program. But if you had an assertion, you could just assert that it's not null and the verifier and the JIT will, will handle unwinding the program for you and like you don't have to have all that extra code 
Um, yeah, it does clean up and, and everything like that. So if you've reasoned about your program correctly, it won't be hit. But if you haven't, then it'll the program will exit and, and everything will be taken care of for you. Another LVM optimization was that, uh, just for sake of example, it was in the past where it was we had a code where a function would return a boolean, and then after the returns we had some like check casted to integer like check and then return zero or one. And compiler said, well, since it's a boolean, it can only have like two values, but there is no Boolean in assembly, so it was a 32 bit integer. And the verifier said, well, you return 32 bit integer, but this uh, function can only like accept like zero and one. So if you check return code, no, it's outside. So and yeah, those bugs are so hard to find, too. So it'd be great to you know, help uh, improve that. Participate, participate in this conversation because it's really just like few people like me and Honk and Andre that argue with all the M people and there's a huge community here. Like they need to hear that it's not only like two people. Like when for LLVM folks, when we were upstreaming the whole BPF backend, the first question was whether it's a toy project. Is it a research something? Like what's this? Like who's gonna maintain it? Some of them like still think it's like, yeah, what's this? stuff. And this discussion happened on the LLVM mailing list yes. or on the change Yes, on all the M on all the M divs. What I wanted to ask, uh, like from the feedback inside Meta, do you also see any other burning topics? I mean obviously the verifier is the highest one that you make it that you have to make it more easy to use, but do you also see like for the broader community, other aspects that we need to work on to lower the barrier of adoption? Mm, I don't know. Uh, anyone from Meta wants to answer? Yeah, and I don't want to, I don't want to capitalize the mic, so if other people have thoughts they can add, but I think it would be great if we were more consistent with features that we implement. Like for a lot of the times we'll add something and it's only supported by like four different map types, even though it really is generalizable to a lot more. So it would be, I think it would be helpful if either it was, it was very easy to discover what features are, are usable where, or we, um, we were just like, we had more of a culture where we're like, okay, well, if you're gonna implement this for array maps and hash maps, implement it for local storage if it applies there, just to take the guesswork out of, out of users, you know, out of the user's uh, plate. Yeah, and another part that even in the hyperscalers, uh, the difference in the kernels and have to, the services have to support all the kernels. It's same as with any startup. Like most of the startup, they suffer from the issue that yeah, the latest BPF and the latest verifier understand all of it, but my customers are still using RHEL, whatever version X, so it's some old kernel with some number of backports, and who knows what these backports are. So, yeah. Skipping back to the LLVM discussions, how do we make sure that people that follow BPF mailing list actually are aware of those LLVM discussions? <laughs> Question, do you have a suggestion? <laughs> uh, not really, like, so LLVM uses a fabricator system. Like, if we can somehow auto-subscribe BPF mailing list, maybe that would be, basically, like, we need to make a decision whether we spam BPF mailing list with LLVM discussions related to BPF, and then we can try to figure out, like, how to do this. But basically, I, I can see the point, right? Like, who knew about those discussions, except for those, like, three people involved, right? Yeah, so in the past, the fabricator had the email interface. You can type your emails and it would automatically push it back as a comments on a diff. And it was fragile, so four years ago, they said like, nope, they uh, stopped this uh, bot. So now to comment on a diff, you have to log in into fabricator and that's the only way. I guess maybe we should start doing it like manually. Every time we start a new LLVM diff, we just send like extra email with a link to the diff saying like, well, we started this feature yep. or fix or whatever. And then like whoever wants to follow, go register and follow. Yep, yep, absolutely. The latest one that prob also could be controversial, though shouldn't be, is uh, we're adding uh, BTF support to LLVM object dump. 
should be no brainer just because well we just want to lm dump dodge dump like not only emit dwarf but emit btf but it is for some reason controversial uh, So I think I've took way too much time already. My half an hour expired yeah. long ago. I mean, uh, yeah, like we started super early, and actually your session would start now, <laughs> initially. Uh, so we now actually have half an hour. Um, but maybe we can, we can continue with whoever is next. Yeah.